Boy, some great clips from some of the most famous betrayals in movie history. And as you look at those characters, if you're like me, you think to yourself, thank goodness I'm not like them. I would never be disloyal. I would never say that kind of thing. I would not turn my back on my friends the way they did. I wouldn't turn my back on my family the way they did. And we feel self-righteous compared to these betrayers. Today on Clickbait, we're looking at Judas's betrayal and what happens next will blow your mind. Because I am amazed over the years of working with folks, good people, decent people, put in the right circumstance, feeling unappreciated in a marriage long enough, feeling disrespected at work given just the right amount of time, and our ability to cross lines, break promises, turning our back on people who invested in us is really it's shocking. I am shocked at what I'm capable of if you put me in the wrong environment. In fact, don't we say things like, you hear this all the time, people say, I'm wrestling with my demons, wrestling with my appetites, wrestling with my appetite for anger, my appetite for, for consumption, my appetite for betrayal or resentment or revenge. Today, as we look at Judas's story, Judas never saw himself as a betrayer. Judas never saw himself as somebody who was going out to be the bad guy. Judas saw himself as somebody who was trying to bring God's kingdom to earth quicker because Jesus' speed wasn't quite fast enough for him. What are you and I capable of if our demons took control of the driver's seat of our lives? Judas hanging from a tree is a grim image. The historic account of the life of Jesus has all the elements of a good gripping drama got a charismatic central hero murdered for his beliefs. And like any good drama, there's a villain. There are actually quite a few bad guys in our story. There's the Pharisees, the Sadducees, Pontius Pilate, and the Roman guards. These are some nasty fellows. But the pivotal character is Judas. Sold out his friend for 30 pieces of silver. Greedy. Think about those movie clips we saw earlier. Scar from Lion King, Fredo from Godfather movie, Cypher from The Matrix. When greed intersects with inferiority, you get betrayal. These are some classic bad guys whose chief issue is that they're disloyal. Yeah, not like them. But real life backstabbers get harsh treatment from the outside world. Think of Bernie Madoff, brazenly stole billions from unsuspecting investors, including charities, widows, and retirees. What a villain. Brad Pitt stepped out on America's sweetheart, Jennifer Aniston. What a villain! Yeah, he and Angelina may adopt orphans and build schools in Africa, but we'll always see him as the cheater. President Nixon committed outrageous abuse of power during the Watergate scandal. What a villain. But think about your own life. You ever found somebody, a family member, a friend who stabbed you in the back? Somebody you didn't see coming? Stuff like that that's hard to repair, and what could be worse? That brings us back to Judas. He stabbed Jesus in the back. His mentor, his rabbi, his leader, his friend. What a villain. And he's such a villain that his name became synonymous with betrayal. When someone commits an act of treason or disloyalty, we even call them today. What a Judas. My guess is that if you searched online for the top ten boys' names, Judas doesn't come up very high. In fact, I did just that. The website Nameberry, Judas is ranked 1,461 in the names, which makes him higher than Galileo, Hoyt, and even Larry. Sorry if your name is Larry. Judas beats you out. By the name, by the way, Chad is 763, down from its all-time high of 25 in my birth year, 1973. Anyway, I digress. Judas. Judas Iscariot is known for his greed, he's known for his betrayal, he's also known for his suicide. Suicide is a tragic and dreadful act. Often its perpetrator is a person overwhelmed with desperation, completely lacking in hope. From time to time, we hear about suicides in our culture, puts it in the mainstream consciousness. A celebrity like Kurt Cobain or Robert Williams takes their life in its front page news. But suicide is difficult and perplexing, esteemed as unforgivable act by many, it's referenced in hushed tones, and many of us don't know how to act when it happens. We're reluctant to discuss it, and if a family member or friend in our community is touched by it, we just don't know what to say. Cobain and Williams were tormented by depression and drug abuse, so it's easy to give them a pass, but society likes to call suicide a cop-out, cowardly. 
If that's true, then Judas is left with quite a resume of unflattering adjectives. He's greedy, he's disloyal, he's cowardly. Not sure you can get much worse than that. But the series is called Clickbait, and I want to entice you to think that maybe there's more to the story than what we've been led to believe. What if I were to tell you that Judas was no more of a villain than you or me? Let's pray. Father, we just ask uh, this morning that you would give us the freedom to look in our own hearts and see what areas of betrayal or darkness or pain might be in us. God, that you would open our eyes to blind spots. For those who've come in this morning looking at the condition of our world with all of the murder and all of the mayhem, God, it is so easy to feel hopeless. And so, Father, I ask that you would give hope and give uh, love in the midst of difficulty to each one of us here today. And we ask this in your name. Amen. Well, if you don't know the story of Judas, we showed you a little video clip of some of the story. But basically, he was a man who betrayed his friend for 30 pieces of silver. He was the treasurer for Jesus' uh, ministry. And apparently, they had enough money that the treasurer was stealing from them and no one noticed. And ultimately, his act of betrayal was so devastating to him that he will commit suicide at the end of his life. But I want to propose to you that the real story behind the headlines is that Judas wasn't so much scandalous or a scoundrel as he was ambitious. And it was his ambition for something good that motivated him to cross the lines to get the reputation he has today. So you need to understand what was going on during that time of history. The Romans had been in charge of the area of Jerusalem for years and they had been brutal oppressors. And they have done horrible things to keep control of that area of the world. In fact, I got a chance to visit climbing up the backside of the Sea of Galilee. There is a, a incredible mountainous uh, climb. My, both my kids went to Israel this summer, and this is a picture my daughter took of this area climbing up to the mountain that overlooks the Sea of Galilee. There in that area are giant caves, deep caves, dug by the zealots. And the zealots and the Maccabeans, or the Maccabees, They were trying to rebel against Rome because of how cruel Rome was, how devastating Rome was, the way they crucified your friends and your neighbors, the way in which they would come in and take your children or your daughters or your wives. So the the zealots were actually doing a a Red Dawn kind of guerrilla warfare coming against the Romans and starting to be somewhat successful. But they were scared that the Romans would come against their family. So they dug these caves or carved out these caves in this hillside where they hid their wives and hid their children from the Romans. The Romans discover the zealots are hiding their family members here. They lower down cages, go into these caves and take the women and children, slit their throats and throw them off the cliff. And they land in this valley It is said that over 5,000 people died, women and children, that day because of the brutality of the Romans. And Judas is so tired of the occupation. He is so sick of hearing another sad story of some brutal murder that he says, I will do anything to get the Romans out of here. I will do anything to get the Romans from advocating and administering their view of justice to my friends and family. And so he meets a man named Jesus. And Jesus uses all the code words that he's a Messiah. He does miracles. He's born in the right place. He's got the right family. He calls himself the Son of Man, a term used in the book of Daniel to describe the Messiah coming. And as he's doing the miracles, Judas is, getting more and, Judas is getting more and more excited. This is the guy who's going to take down the Roman Empire. This is the guy that's going to bring God's kingdom come, and we're finally going to be free. But after following him for months, a year, two years, three years, he's not building an army. And this is frustrating to Judas. And he realizes he needs to force Jesus' hand. He needs to nudge to orchestrate, to manipulate, or to manage the situation, to put Jesus face to face with his real enemy, the Romans, so that Jesus will do what he knows Jesus wants to do, overthrow the Roman Empire. To hurry up God's plan and to bring about the revolution. And he is committed to do this at all costs. But when you pursue something at all costs, 
don't be surprised when it ends up costing you everything. When you pursue something at all costs, don't be surprised when that thing ends up costing you absolutely everything. So we're going to look at three lessons from Judas' life and how his ambition blinded him. And my hope is that we can open our eyes to our own blind spots and that we can also avoid the kind of pain that he found the break in relationships with friends, with mentors, and ultimately the loss of his own life. Lesson number one. When you pursue something at all costs, it can blind you to the bill. You're not thinking about the bill. You're thinking about the goal. And, and there's good stuff there. You're goal-oriented. You've got a desire. You're t- trying to accomplish something. And even that thing is good. We're getting rid of the Romans. But when you pursue it at all costs, you lose track of how much it's costing you. You're blind to it. Judas, in wanting to get rid of the Romans, it says, Judas, surnamed Iscariot, was numbered among the twelve. He went his way and he conferred with the power brokers of the day, those who were actually out to get Jesus, the chief priests and captains. And he was looking for how he might betray him and put Jesus in a place where he would have to be confronting the Roman Empire. Now, they were glad. Oh, my goodness. Finally, we got an inside man. And they agreed to give him some money if he would do this. So he promised to seek out an opportunity to betray Jesus, to capture Jesus away from the crowds and multitudes. And he's totally blind because he's weighing. And this is what happens with your ambition, all of our ambition. You're weighing. Sure, I'm going to have to sort of live a double life and be duplicitous because I'm going to pretend I'm I'm getting Jesus away because I want to hang out with him and I'm really trying to manipulate him. But I'm weighing that duplicitousness against the money I'm going to make in this situation. Sure, I'm going to compromise my integrity. That is a problem. But think of the influence I'm going to have amongst the power brokers of the day. I'm going to be able to do so many good things in the situation. And think about how many people are going to be so much better without the Romans in place. So, yeah, there's some bad sides. I'm going to have to betray my friend. I'm going to lose some good relationships. But on the other hand, look at all the advantages of what I'm pursuing. If you've ever seen the TV show called Turn by AMC. It's a historic drama that tells the story of Benedict Arnold. And again, Benedict Arnold, another person who's known for being a betrayer. But it tells the story historically that Benedict Arnold was an incredibly ambitious general. And he loved the fact that he could accomplish things that people didn't think could be done. He liked the fact that he could accomplish things that other people said couldn't be done. Well, I can relate to that. So his commander would come to him and say, listen, we are not ready. Uh, This is not the time to take that city or push that line or take that front. So his commanding officer would tell him not to attack a city. We're not ready yet. And all Benedict heard was, not ready yet. That's a challenge I can overcome. So he would come against his supporting officers, and he would actually take his army into that city, cross that line, win the battle, and come back. And everybody said, wow, nobody thought that could be done. You're incredible. And Benedict Arnold got known for his ambition, his ability to accomplish things that his superiors didn't think could be done. And in all that glory, in all that ambition, in all the good things he was doing for our country, the British began to notice his insubordination. And the British began to realize this is the kind of guy we could turn, not because he's a bad guy, but because he's an ambitious guy. And in his ambition to have glory, in his ambition for power, in his ambition to want more, we can turn this guy to our side. And that's exactly what they did. They used his ambition because it blinded him to his faults. Isn't that a term we use today? Blind ambition? In fact, did you know the word blind ambition? The word ambition comes from the Latin word ambitio, which means to go around something. And in one sense, that's what makes us good leaders. That's what makes us good problem solvers. That's what makes us good creative thinkers. We say, I'm trying to get from here to there, and I've got to find a way around the obstacles, around the challenges. And that's a positive. That is a strength. That's a God-given thing. But in the midst of being ambitious and getting around certain things, we can be blind to the things that we walked around. Maybe we shouldn't have gone around that one. I talked to a friend about a month ago who's a pilot. 
I said, hey, how's the, uh, how's the career going? He said, it's going great. I said, last time we talked was about five years ago, and you were uh, sort of at the bottom of the food chain as a, as a pilot. He said, yeah, I've worked my way up. I'm at the top of seniority now. I get to pick any uh, route I want. The freedom is great. I'm now able to spend time with my, my family in ways that I always wanted to. I said, well, great. Well, what's going on now? He said, well, I got an opportunity to be captain. I said, well, how does that work? He said, well, the difference between pilot and captain is a lot more money, a lot more perks, but you start back at the bottom of the food chain as far as seniority goes. So part of me really wants all the perks. On the other hand, I don't know if I want to go back to being totally unavailable to my wife and kids for the next three years when my kids are this age. And what's he doing? It's not blind ambition. That's somebody who's saying, I know my ambitions, but I'm weighing the cost. As a creative thinker, I've never found a rule or an obstacle I didn't want to bend or break. That's just me. And that's usually what allows me to accomplish things that couldn't otherwise be accomplished. But sometimes in my creativity and my problem solving and my desire to accomplish, that creative thinking becomes blind ambition. And I, 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 instead of bending a line or pushing a boundary, I break a boundary. And so my strength of creativity works against me in my ambition, which is why this first lesson is so important. We need to be so careful that in our at-all-cost attitude, we don't get blind to the cost of our ambition. Even the idea of saying, I'm not like Judas, I would never do something like that. I would just suggest to you that maybe you're being blind to your own capacity for betrayal, your own capacity for self-delusion. I think we should start by saying there's some Judas in me and I need to be careful that I don't let him take control of the wheel. So lesson one, an all cost attitude blind you to the cost. But secondly, the second lesson we see here from Judas is that at an all cost attitude can sometimes cost you everything. When you pursue something at all costs, it can cost you everything. So the question is, what if Judas, at the end of his life, looked back at what he had done and said, oh my goodness, what I gained was not worth what I paid. What if Judas was remorseful? What if he wished he hadn't done what he did? Well, in the Bible we find out that's exactly what happened. He's incredibly remorseful. He didn't overthrow the Romans. He didn't get the plan put in place, he thought. He got all the downsides of his ambition and not the upsides. Here's how the Bible says it. It says, Judas, his betrayer, he's now got the nickname by the time this book is written. He's now known as Judas, oh yeah, the betrayer. So the first thing he loses, it costs him everything, his reputation, his name, his friendship. That he had been condemned. Jesus was condemned. Judas was remorseful. Oh no, that's not what I wanted to happen. And he brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders and says, Oh, I sinned, I betrayed an innocent person. And look at how they respond. The same way anyone responds who uses you to cross certain boundaries, be it your own conscience, your conscience, the people involved, the situation says, What's it to us? We got what we wanted. But I thought, I, What's it to you? You take care of it. We're not here to help. And he threw the pieces of silver into the temple and departed and went and ultimately said, what kind of a person would do this? And he hung himself. What I got was not worth what I paid. Deep regret, remorse. I wish, I wish, I wish I could go back. I remember my friend Steve. He and Elizabeth had been coming to our church in Atlanta for a couple of years and they said, do you mind, we'd like to share our story. And so we talked to them a little bit about their story, and, and they agreed to come up and share their story on stage one day. And the story was this. Steve said, you know, I was in a marriage, and I was feeling unappreciated. And instead of working for my marriage, I started saying to myself, the grass is greener. I sort of made an unwise decision. At the time, it didn't seem unwise. I was trying to get fit, so I found myself a trainer. The trainer was a beautiful woman. The beautiful woman ended up being my now wife, Elizabeth. And Elizabeth and Steve talked about how their affair that had destroyed his marriage and broken up relationships and how sorrowful they were. And worse than that, that this relationship, this affair that had promised all good things, all the things an affair promises, you know, because it's a fantasy, not a reality, 
built their new relationship on distrust. Boy, if you're willing to cheat on your last wife, how can I know I can trust you? And how as they came to find the God of the Bible, they found that he could forgive them for what they've done. They had to go and make reconciliation with his ex-spouse and he apologized for what he had done and his betrayal. But he also said, I, I'm now realizing the cost of what I did, the cost to our marriage, the cost of my integrity, the cost of my moral authority as a father. I'm so remorseful because I... At the time, it seemed like a quick pleasure. I deserve this. I'm not appreciated. Our relationship's sort of going cold anyway. But now I wish I could go back. It's cost me everything. The 30 pieces of silver probably seemed like a great deal at the time. And now he's like, it wasn't worth it. And he throws it back to him. But why does he throw it back? Why 30 pieces of silver? Why does he bring it to this location? Why on this day and why in this place? I want to propose to you that it's perhaps because Judas was trying to do things God's way. What? That in his remorse, I think he was trying to find his way back to God. Ultimately, he'll realize that maybe God's forgiveness he doesn't think is big enough for what he's done. Let me take you back in time to another book in the Bible called Zechariah. Interesting book. God shows up and the nation of Israel has been destroyed. Persia has taken over from the Babylonians and sent the people back to rebuild the temple for the first time. Zerubbabel's come back. He's a, he's a commander. He's a, he's a political leader. And God says in the book of Zechariah, I want you to be careful of how you think I'm going to put my plans in motion. I'm going to send a Messiah that he called the branch. And right now there's two leaders in your midst. One leader is Joshua. He is a high priest. As a high priest, I'm going to bring my kingdom come into the world through the priestly power of forgiveness and through loving my enemies. On the other hand, there's another person I have sent to this area, and his name is Zerubbabel. And he's a military political governor leader. But it's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. I don't want you to confuse how I'm going to bring about my plan. Don't think it's about political power. It's about priestly power. So keep that in mind. He turns to Zechariah and says, my my people are so confused on how I'm going to bring about the Messiah. They're going to think it's a military commander versus a priestly one. That I want you right now, right now, I want you to grab the silver and gold that came from the captives. Next slide. And I want you to run and I want you to make out of that a crown. And I want you to take that crown and I want you to place it not on the military commander, Zerubbabel. I want you to put it on the head of Joshua, the high priest, so that my people will know that my plan for the Messiah is that a priest would be on the throne, not a military dictator. That he would bring about a council of peace. I think Judas read this. And realize, oh my goodness, I did the same thing that they did 400 years ago. I mixed up God's plan. I thought he was going to come as a military commander that overthrew the Romans like Zerubbabel. And instead he was going to come as a priest who would die to intercede for the people. Like Jesus did. And I think he kept reading in Zechariah. And Zechariah says, and so here's what I want you to do. If you mix up the difference between these two, I want you... To take the wages that were poured out for me. 400 years this is written before Jesus' birth. More than that, but at least 400. And look at the specifics. They weighed out for me wages. 30, 30 pieces of what? Silver. Imagine with inflation rates trying to predict in advance 400 years later how the Messiah would be betrayed with 400 pieces of silver. And when you understand that you were given wages because of your misunderstanding of God's leadership style, political versus priestly, you were to take that silver and throw it to the potter. That princely price they set on me, and I took the 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. This is written 400 years before Judas. And I think Judas is going, this is how I get back. This is how I get right with God. I've got to go to the house of the Lord, and I've got to throw the silver and say, I mixed up God's plan in my ambition to get rid of the Romans I thought God would do it through political power not priestly power and these coins and throwing them back was a way of saying I'm sorry I was wrong I mixed up God's agenda I was not submitted to his plan I thought I knew better than him but ultimately his betrayal was so deep that he did not think God could forgive it 
Judas was remorseful because he thought that what he had done was too big for God to forgive. We've talked a lot about suicide over the last year. Just because we've had several people in our church who've committed suicide. And I'll just say again, from a Christian perspective, let me tell you why suicide's wrong and whether or not it's forgivable. Suicide is not wrong because it hurts other people. That is true, but that's not why it's wrong. The reason Christians believe that suicide is wrong is because God is the author of life. And so when you take your own life, you're putting yourself in the place of God. And that's why suicide's wrong. However, when you judge other people, you know what you're doing? Putting yourself in the place of God. When you worry about the world, it's saying, God, I don't like how you're controlling things, so I'm going to worry and control things through my own worry. You're putting yourself in the place of God. So though suicide is wrong, it's not unforgivable. Nowhere in the Bible does it say it's unforgivable. What causes suicide? Sometimes it's biochemical changes and somebody who was thinking fine a second ago, something biochemically happens. Sometimes it means thinking a lie, acting in the midst of feeling a lie. And so the great news of the grace of God that Judas did not get is that suicide is forgivable. The grace of God, though he doesn't endorse suicide, can cover the shame and the guilt And for many of us, we've had the scar of somebody we cared about died like Judas did. But worse than that, it became a secret in our family that you can't talk about. And we had the pain, and now the grief, and now the shame, and now the secrecy. And so I just want you to know that we have a lot of folks in our church who wrestled with suicide. And I want you to know that you're I hope you're discovering a God who can give you hope when you're discouraged and depressed. And if you're If you're discouraged and nobody knows, everybody looks like your life's together like Judas does. You're the treasurer. You're the CEO of Jesus' ministry. But behind the scenes, there's remorse and there's darkness. I want you to know that God wants to meet you in your fear. He can bring hope into a hopeless situation. And even in your ambition that may have led you to places you never thought you'd go, crossing lines you never thought you'd cross, God still wants to step into the mess. When I was 17, one of our family friends, Dal Mitchell, committed suicide. He'd been friends with my father since my father was 16 and accidentally ran his motorcycle into one of his bushes. <laughs> they became friends, and I got to know him you know, from very early on. He was an artist. He had em- emphysema, even though he'd stopped smoking you know, five, six years ago, which required him to carry an oxygen tank with him. He came to our little small town post office there, and he left his oxygen tank in the car. It was a s- short little walk to get his mail and yet he totally lost his breath and, and there was nobody there it's a small little town and as he was making his way back to his car he fell to the ground and was crawling his way gasping for air and made his way back into his jeep and got the oxygen mask back on the fear and panic of that moment set him on a course to take his own life so much so that when we discovered his body as a family we found the books that he'd been reading about how to commit suicide He had a note on the door. My mom was a vice president of a company that did in-home care for senior citizens. And he put a note on the door for his caregiver to not enter the room because of carbon monoxide poisoning, but to call 911. I talked to my mom this week, just remember the story. And she said God had prompted her a week before his suicide to write him a letter. She'd never written him a letter before and just tell him how much she appreciated his friendship. More than that, how much she appreciated the friend he'd been to my father. And it talked about, I know things are tough, and I know the sickness and the pain is wearing on you, but I want you to know that God wants to work in the midst of this. Now, ultimately, I don't know where Dow is. That was between him and God. But what I do know is in the midst of the difficulty and challenges of life, you can really be worn down by the betrayal, by anger, by what people do to you or what happens to you. I want you to know that this can be a place of hope. But I also want you to know for those in your life who have committed suicide, there, there is redemption. God's grace is big enough to forgive even that. And my hope is, and, and actually Dow wrote all of his Christian friends a letter about how he had made his peace with God. And though I don't agree with his rationale, I do believe that God's grace and forgiveness can work even in that. What's bizarre when you think about the compromises 
He said, if Judas had realized that God could have forgiven him, we could have a story like the story of Peter, a man who betrays Jesus but still finds forgiveness and becomes a leader in the church. But Judas could not believe that what he had done could be forgivable. He throws the money to the chief priest. And the chief priest, again, you just see incredible compromise and people keeping their power. The chief priests take the money and they say, well, we can't put this money in the treasury. Why not? Well, there's a rule that says you don't put blood money in the treasury. Now, think about that for a second. We're totally okay with using the money to hire a mercenary to kill a guy. But let's not put that in the main general account. But isn't that what we do? You can see the financial fudging going on. You can see the the rationale in their mind. So they consulted together and said, what should we do? Also coming out of Zechariah, I might add. And they buy with the field a cemetery to bury people in. Which ends up being the very cemetery that Judas ends up hanging himself. And they call that place the field of blood. And an interesting behind the scenes historic reference to this place, that field of blood is called the Hinnom Valley. And in 1948, when Israel was reestablished as a nation, fulfilling prophecies predicted hundreds of years in advance, the UN came in and they turned to Israel and said, hey, we want to help you. We want to be your protector. We want to negotiate on your behalf. And they said, oh, we've got just a piece of land for you, UN. And guess what piece of land Israel gave the UN to build their headquarters? Built on the field of blood the home of the betrayer, (laughs) shows about how much Israel trusted the UN back during those times, maybe still. The cost. For Judas, it cost him everything. It cost him his family. It cost him his life. It cost him his friends. It cost him forgiveness. It cost him hope. Which brings us to our last lesson, is that when you pursue something at all costs, you can convince yourself you know it all. And that's the problem. You don't have people in your life to push back and question your thinking and say, whoa, 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 I don't think that's quite right. I think you've crossed the line here. You, you, you convince yourself you know it all and you don't have enough people in your life who love you enough and, and, and are, are, can risk your relationship enough to say, whoa, 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 you've become a know it all. That is off base. That is not appropriate. That is not right. The goal, which is good, is having you cross lines that you shouldn't cross. And Judas became a know-it-all. He thinks he has figured out exactly how to get rid of those Romans. And Jesus is going to do these miracles. He's going to come face to face with the Romans. Liberty is going to come and the whole place is going to be changed. And he shows up that day with the multitude and with the guards. And he comes up to Jesus and he thinks he's got Jesus fooled. Wow, fooled. Rabbi, good to see you. Man, this is working just as I planned. Which Jesus, I love this, turns to him and says, Hey, Judas, are you, uh, are you betraying the Son of Man with a kiss? He knows. Yes, he knows. You can't outsmart God. You will reap what you sow. For God is not mocked. In due time, you do reap what you sow. And G- Jesus just calls him on the carpet and says, You think you know it all? No, you're not fooling anybody. And you're certainly not fooling me. I know exactly what you're doing here. In fact, that's why I'm here. I'm going to die on that cross for your betrayal, for your unfaithfulness, for your conniving, and for your ambition. Not just for yours, but for all human beings who think they know it all. I'm dying on behalf of that very attitude. Blind ambition. There's a book written about that in the 70s was uh, written by a guy named John Dean. He was recruited to the presidential council by um, Nixon in 1970. He would actually be in prison by 1974. As he was uh, put in place, they found he was the kind of guy who could get stuff done and could get around and DCO obstacles. One reviewer of this article described the book this way, and I thought it was so good in describing what is in all of us we need to be careful of, that know-it-all attitude. Here's what it says. John Dean was one of the sleaziest White House operatives. Look what he described him. A compulsively ambitious striver. Before he lied, before he betrayed, and before he turned his back on the very people he was helping, 
This is what he was known for, compulsively ambitious striving, who pandered to his superior's worst impulses. He largely engineered the cover-up of the illegal activities and then turned informer in time to plea bargain for himself. Oh my goodness, this didn't get me power. I'll get it this way. It's difficult to believe that such petty-minded and amoral individuals could have attained such positions of power in the executive branch of the United States government. Blind ambition brings into focus, here it is, the process which gave many of these men their jobs and their power and the links to which they were willing to go when the power was threatened. And isn't that in all of us? The links we go to climb the ladder, the links we go to get influence, the links we go to get our, our, our company or get our, 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 our family into the right situation. And the links that we went to get the power are the same links that we go to keep the power. And then keeping the power and keeping the goal becomes more important than how we got here or why we got here to begin with. Which is why I think our challenge today, the thing we need to wrestle with is this. Have you ever considered the cost of your ambition? Again, ambition is a great thing. It's a God-given thing. Something that we should be celebrated until it turns to blind ambition. What's been the cost of your ambition? Let's look at a few areas. How about the risks to your health? In all your ambition of building your career, have you had a doctor who said to you, you, you've got to stop being under this kind of stress? Have you had a medical professional say to you something like, or haven't you said it to somebody? Your heart can't take ten more years of this. You worry too much. You're way stressed out all the time. And the cost of your ambition is that you are destroying your body. The risks to your health has been the cost of your ambition. You've been blind to it until that heart attack or until that report. How about the cost of your recreation? Remember you said, hey, I want to have several homes. I want to do great things. And in your ambition, you bought those great things. But you don't have time to relax. You don't have time to go on vacation. You've got a lake house that it's July and you still haven't been able to visit the lake house because of the cost to your recreation. You've created a scenario where your job is so so taking up all your time that you can't do the very thing the job is supposed to provide, a life where you know how to relax, to rest, to not be on all the time, know how to recreate. You can't think of the last time you had a date night or had actually time to be with those children that you were going about all these ambitions for. But the cost of your relationship, for many of us, the cost of our ambition is we just haven't had time to build friendship. We just don't have the time for it. We're really good at estate planning. We've got the estate planning all together for our kids. We just didn't have time to actually invest and get to know our kids. I want to tell you, it's not too late. Whether your kids are in their 20s or 30s, Just like Judas, God can work in the midst of it, but you've got to consider the cost of your ambition and say, maybe it's time to change course. You don't want your marriage to start off good like many do, and then slowly you begin to live parallel lives under the same home, and then empty nest comes, and you wonder why you're living in a room with a stranger. Because the cost of your ambition is the thing you cared about and set about to begin with is being lost. Or maybe lastly, it's the cost of rationalization. You see where you are today and there's a lot of great things and you're weighing all the benefits. But when you look at the cost of your rationalization, you realize, oh my goodness, I have crossed lines I never thought I'd cross. I've gone places I didn't think I'd go. I stayed longer here than I ever thought I'd stay. I have begun to talk rationalization to myself all the time. And here's my hope for you. God wants to save your life. God wants to rescue you from the downsides to all these costs that are weighing up and accumulating it behind the scenes. And God says, I want to rescue you. In the same way Peter denied Jesus and Judas denied Jesus, Peter found a God that could forgive him and could lead him in the midst of his betrayal. Could lead him from where he was betraying Jesus three times, cursing his name even, to becoming the leader of the church that changed the world. Wherever you are, whether you're one step over the line or ten steps over the line, whether you're at the point where you're feeling the consequences to your marriage falling apart or family falling apart, and you're beginning to feel the remorse, I wish I could go back. Wherever you are, God wants to forgive you, and more than that, He wants to lead you. God is the kind of God who comes to save us. And He was doing everything in His power to get Judas' attention. Judas, I'm here to save your life.
before it's too late. I like to think that Jesus would have said those same words as Judas. If I had known that you were going to commit suicide tonight, I would have stayed up with you all night. Though you didn't stay up with me to pray when I faced my final hour, I would have stayed up for you in your moment of weakness. I just ask you today, maybe as we end in prayer, that maybe God's speaking to you and saying, I'm trying to save you from bitterness, save you from ambition, save you, save you from the cost you're not even realizing you're accumulating. Or maybe as you look at the condition of the world and all the horrible news that seems to come every two days now of terrorist attacks, you're like, you know, I'm feeling the fear, I'm feeling the anxiety, I'm feeling the boy, it'd be better off just not to even live in this place. And I don't want you to leave today without knowing that you're cared for, that you're loved, that there is hope as well. So I'm going to lead you into prayer, and you can just pray whatever parts of this pertain to you. God, open my eyes to the cost of my ambition. God, forgive me for the lines I've crossed. Forgive me for the good things that I sacrificed to get to where I am. God, help me in my despair. God, I need your comfort. God, I need strength. I'm feeling... I'm feeling overwhelmed because this situation isn't going to change. And I need to know that you're with me, even if it doesn't. Father, we come against the spirit of fear. We come against the spirit of hopelessness. We come against any spirit or lie that is anyone's heart here this morning or mine that would tell them that their life is not worth living, that this chapter is the final one, and we know you want to have the final word. So, Father, we ask that you inject hope into each heart, you inject life into each heart, God, that you would restrain evil in our world, and, God, that in the midst of the darkest, darkest hour, we would look to the cross and we would remember that you are an absolute master of taking that which was intended for evil and using it for good. And we put our confidence in that, not as wishful thinking, but as the historic reality of the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for being here today. If you came uh, and just want somebody to chat with or put a name to the face, we'd love to meet you. Third door on your left is the hearth room. Also, if you came prepared to give financially, there's some offering boxes right outside the door. Thanks for being here. We'll see you next week as we continue Clickbait Part 3. Thanks again. <laughs>